Our first speaker, Dr. Tanya Kai, is the director of the National Maori Language Institute and the International Center for Language Revitaliz Revitalization. She's a professor of language revitalization at Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. And she has been involved in Maori language revitalization intervention for 30 years. And her research programs include the Immersion Maori Language Nests and Immersion Maori Language Primary Schools. And her publications reflect this work with the community. Dr. Kaya has worked in tertiary education for 36 years, 23 of these in university education as a full professor. Dr. Kaya grew up in a family with a cultural landscape drawn from both a Maori and Pacific heritage, including New Zealand Maori, native Hawaiian, Cook Islands Maori, and Samoan. She's broadly admired for her work in indigenizing the academy and in validization of indigenous knowledge and methods within academia. She is respected by indigenous communities for her leadership in ensuring that communities benefit from the research and projects the Institute of Center, Institute and Center undertake, making as many digital resources as possible. Earlier we were talking about social media, digital me resources providing free access to the aid in language revitalization and regeneration. And her work is one of the most successful examples of what uh, can be done. And she's currently a trustee on the Pacific Education Center Board and vice president of Australex. Our second, the second speaker is Miriam Yakato, uh, Yatako. Sorry, she's a Peruvian-born language rights advocate, an expert in indigenous education, and a trained social linguist. She was a fa faculty member at NYU Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development for 22 years. Her scholarly and activist interests lie in areas of sociolinguistics. Her main concern is the defense of linguistic diversity. Having developed an expertise in the area of linguistic rights and language advocacy worldwide, she had indigenous language rights legislation in Peru. Mrs. Yataco has a multilingual background and training in at least six languages of the world. At present, she lives in Peru as an independent scholar and is an associate external faculty and interculturality within the linguistic department of San Marcos University in Lima, Peru. Our third speaker is a uh, Dr. Deborah Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson is a researcher in the Department of Linguistics at UC Berkeley. She earned her PhD in Indo-European Studies with an emphasis on linguistics from UCLA. She earned her BA in Classics from UC Santa Cruz. Dr. Anderson founded and leads the Script Encoding Initiative in the Department of Linguistics at UC Berkeley. She contributes both to the work of Unicode and to the work of the International Organization for Standardization of uh, Subcommittees, Subcommittee 2 on Character Encoding. Within the Unicode Consortium, she is the UC Berkeley representative and serves as a Unicode technical director and editorial committee member. Dr. Anderson established the Script Encoding Initiative in 2002. This effort was inspired by her own scholarly work 
with the script used for Etruscan, which in the early 2000s was not in Unicode. She discovered that the path to making the script digitally accessible was inclusion in the Unicode. Through the experience of writing a proposal for its inclusion, she came to understand the impact encoding all of the world's scripts could have for language communities of modern minority scripts and scholars of historic, historic, historical scripts. Dr. Anderson therefore founded a script encoding initiative to provide a bridge between user communities that typically do not have the technical expertise to author a Unicode proposal and the Unicode Technical Committee tasked with the ex exacting work of verifying script proposals that are ready for inclusion in Unicode, uh, which is, as she tells us, an ir ir irreversible process. Um, so we have, uh, we have our final uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Billy Noseworthy, who is Associate Lecturer in the Department of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has traveled and lived throughout Southeast Asia for the past 10 years, completing in-depth research projects in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. He has several book chapters and articles published in both Vietnamese and English. Recently published works of his include an article on Islamic modernism in Cambodia and Vietnam, as well as several short essays on Vietnamese American and Cambodian American studies, topics for Asian American culture. His current research and teaching interests examine hip hop and social activism as a global phenomenon. Vietnamese literature and politics of uh, populism protests in the 20th century, and the history of Asian religions. This summer, he plans to teach an online course on the history of the South China Sea at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, while he is an SSRC residential fellow at the University of Göttingen at work on his book manuscript, which is tentatively titled, Gods of the Soil, Religion and the State in the Gulf of Thailand Zone. Well, uh, this is my very long introduction to our speakers. And now I invite our first speaker to start, um, Dr. Kayan. <clears throat> okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. To the indigenous people of this land, Great Turtle Island, I acknowledge you as an indigenous visitor to this land. I acknowledge the people of this land that we stand upon today in particular, and your ancestors who watch over this prestigious forum. And I give thanks to the indigenous peoples who have gathered here today and celebrate the many voices and languages that have been handed down from generation to generation. And the cultural knowledge that is contained within. And I greet you today in my own language. Language revitalization. Language revitalization is not an event. It is a process of recovery that is often attributed to the impact of colonization because the indigenous language has been reduced to a minority language. It often requires several generations of families to be engaged in this process to revive and regenerate the language in their families and put a stop to language loss and decline. This can sometimes take several decades. 
Pursuant to this is the matter of creating communities of language speakers as a support for these families and also to safeguard the survival of the language. Joshua Fishman, known by many around the globe as the father of language revitalization, said, as Elsa said and reminded us this morning, it only takes one generation to lose a language and three generations to recover it. When asked, what do you lose when you lose a language, he replied, you are losing all the things that essentially are the way of life, the way of thought, the way of valuing, and the human reality that you are talking about. Māori language revitalization and regeneration of the Māori language is no different. Historically, Māori and Aotearoa New Zealand have led out a number of language revitalization initiatives, some of which have been adopted and adapted by other endangered language speech communities around the world. One example of this is Te Kohanga Reo, the immersion Māori language nests for children from 0 to 5 years old that are underpinned by a philosophy that is focused on whānau family development through the Māori language. Te Kohanga Reo were first established in 1981 and had been heralded as a model of language revitalization and regeneration. Hawaiians have adopted the Kohanga model and introduced a similar model in 1984, customised to the Hawaiian language and culture for their children, not to five years old, which they call Punana Leo. Many of the graduates of Te Kohanga Reo continued their schooling in what is called Māori medium education, electing an immersion Māori language pathway such as Kurakaupapa Māori, Immersion Māori Language Primary Schools, and Farikura, Immersion Māori Language Secondary Schools. Established in 1985, the first wave of, of graduates from these schools are now adults, and many of them are also parents. Some of them have chosen to raise their children in the home in the Māori language, having cho chosen careers in Māori broadcasting, Māori journalism, Māori language teaching and immersion Māori language education, Māori filmmaking, Māori music, Māori academics and other occupations where they can use the Māori language every day. Some of these parents have partners who also have the, have the language and others do not. Te Pukaria, the National Māori Language Institute, is working with 30 families who have high levels of Māori language proficiency and many of them are graduates of, of immersion schooling. They are raising their children in the home in the Māori language. The project is called Te Reo Te Pahara Keke and it seeks to understand the factors that contribute to successful intergenerational transmission of the Māori language in the home. Te Reo Te Pahara Keke plays on a Māori metaphor, namely the harakeke, the flax plant. The rito the center shoot represents a baby or a child. The two blades on either side of the rito symbolize the parents or the grandparents and extended whānau, the family. These are often described as the afirito or mātua as they support the rito and its development, the baby throughout its life. Collectively, they all support the continual growth of the pa harakeke, a collection of harakeke plants that are often reflected as the hapu, the clan of families, the clan of whānau. So for this reason, the rito is never, ever cut. This is the tikanga, the customary law behind this. So te reo o te pa harakeke literally means the language of the clan of families. This research project is the first of its kind in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in that its primary focus is to support and, the, support and understand the challenges of these parents who have a high level of proficiency in te reo Māori 
as they boldly, boldly raise their, their children in the home in the Māori language. The home includes related environments that families function in, such as the supermarket, the beach, the park, the swimming pool, etc. The distinctive element of this project is the focus on the most effective strategies, methods and resources in establishing the Māori language as the first language in the home and providing empirical evidence on the various challenges and barriers that exist while ensuring that the Māori language retains its prominent place in the homes of Māori-speaking parents. The project has engaged speakers of Te Reo Māori from across a wide range of iwi, or tribes, providing a strategy and tools for solidifying the use of Māori language as the primary language of the home. Three tribes, three iwi, have committed five families to each of, of each tribe to this project. We have come to understand over time that educational initiatives such as Kura Kaupapa Māori and Kohanga Reo can only be truly successful if the language is reinforced in the home. There is no doubt. Education on its own won't cut the mustard, won't do it. Schools do, however, have an important part to play in the maintenance and survival of Indigenous, of indigenous languages. Fishman pointed out that successful revival of threatened languages requires reinstating the language firmly in the home through transmission from parents and the child. The view is supported also by Leanne Hinton, who states, if the parent is fluent, then that must be the language of communication between the parent and the child, either at all times or during a significant amount of time. If the home, therefore, is a stronghold of the Māori language, then those children will not have to go to school to learn the Māori language. Rather, the school will reinforce and extend what the child receives at home. So Hinton suggests, when a revitalisation programme results in a large and growing percentage of families using their ancestral language as their home language, so that children are learning it as their first language, then it is time to celebrate and take it off the endangered list. Mm -hmm. It is argued that it's the best time to learn a language is when one is a child. It follows that the revival, survival, and regeneration of a language is within the home. I cannot stress that. Today, that's my, my greatest message to us all. So it is important to seek strategies to address this challenge if the Māori language is to flourish. This project that I'm involved in is one such strategy. As the first language of Aotearoa New Zealand, Te Reo Māori, the Māori language, has an important role to play in the cultural well-being of an increasingly multicultural population. But, as it is, but it's most important for the identity and well-being of Māori, of my well-being as a Māori woman. This project has the potential then to foster a stronger sense of awareness of the prevailing conditions and circumstances that constitute language endangerment in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It will provide an impetus to, to efforts to promote the use of Māori as an everyday language used in a wide range of contexts. Approximately 600,000 people in New Zealand identify as Māori, making up roughly 15% of the national population. We still need to determine the number of speakers in homes raising their children in the language. This project is not designed to teach the language. This project is designed for parents who, though they may not have been raised in a home where their first language was Māori, have gone on to become proficient Te Reo Māori speakers themselves. Their next task is to ensure that their children are raised in Te Reo Māori in the modern world. They need support to ensure that the language journey they embarked on becomes a life journey for their family and for subsequent generations. Some interim findings of, of the research so far. We're now in our second of third year. While the project is only in its second year, there are five themes that have emerged. Vocabulary, familial uh, relationships, external influences and resources, 
The themes and strategies are a result of discussions between the participants and the mentors collectively. And you can see, read for them yourselves, there's an example of, of one aspect of the findings, like in vocabulary, the depth and breadth of vocabulary is a real challenge for the p participants. And these are proficient speakers of the language. You know, where they are, they are struggling, they are looking at, for help and support to, um, to sustain vocabulary. The same can be said of their culture and language. Those are examples that you can see as well. It, we have to ensure that the language is imparted in a way that is consistent with a Māori worldview. Someone mentioned that. It's not just a translation. It's what we call whakaro Māori. So that you have to say it in a way that is in context culturally and has meaning culturally. And, and, and finally, the last slide to show you. Because I know I'm running out of time. So... An important feature of these findings, and this is important for us to understand, is that despite the high language proficiency levels of the participants, they experience similar challenges to learners of the language, beginners and middle learners. But the defining point of difference between the participants in this project and learners or beginners is that these participants are able to sustain language flow in the home without resorting to English, and importantly, they are engaged in creating new native speakers of the language, thus increasing the number of speakers of the, lang of the Māori language in the world. This means that these families are actively engaged in Māori language revitalization, and importantly, maintaining the quality of the language. These families are to be celebrated and commended for their commitment and their endurance to raising their children in the Māori language and for the regeneration of native Māori language speakers. Why? Because it's hard. It's hard every day to sustain language. Every day, many of these parents go to bed and shut the door into their bedroom and then take a breath and speak English to themselves. And because they're searching for also language of love. So, you know, constantly, seven days, to ensure that that whole environment, their children get access to the very best language, it's hard work, especially when the next person who's a friend may live 40 minutes along the end of the motorway, away. That's how far they have to go an hour away for a play date with children of, who can speak the language, who have been raised in the language. These participants reflect the Māori concept of ōkea ururuatia, of fighting like a shark and being relentless in their pursuit of raising their children in Te Reo Māori, despite all of the obstacles and barriers. For these reasons, it is really important that this group of proficient speakers is not overlooked or remain invisible in terms of investment of funding. Let us not forget these speakers for the significant contribution they are making to Māori language revitalization. Because in my country, most often the investment is made for beginners. This is a strong rationale to have a more even spread of funding and resources across all levels of language speakers, from beginners to advanced levels. So, the results of this research project will inform future Māori language strategies and plans, influence an entire generation of mostly second language, proficient Māori speaking language as a language learned through intergener intergenerational language transmission. It will foster the regeneration of native speakers in our homes and communities so we can see native speakers of te reo Māori, the Māori language, as part of our future, not just our past. With the increase of families raising their children in the language and with few resources except a strong commitment to the language, communities will be resuscitated 
and the language becomes normalized. The last native speaker in my family was born in 1881. He was my great-grandfather, married my great-grandmother. Both of them were native speakers. The last three generations in my family, my mother born in 1936, me born in 1957, and my daughter born in 1984, Rachel, have worked tirelessly over 61 consecutive years to regenerate the language in our family with a commitment to breaking the cycle of language loss, a commitment that relies heavily on endurance and resilience. The birth of my granddaughter and the in the apple of my eye, my world, Mahia Lani Te Aroha, Ka Ai Mahuta, was born in December 2017, reflects a mammoth watershed in this language revitalization process for my family. As she will be the first native speaker since her great 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 grandfather was born in 1881, a difference of 136 years. We know Mahia Lani will emerge strong in her language and culture, being raised in the knowledge that my language is my voice, my heritage and my right, because it is who I am, it is my identity. The next challenge before us is to build communities of learning to support her and her family, to support us in our language journey. Thank you. First, I would like to thank the organizers for having invited me to share my work in this symposium. I come all the way from Peru. I, I arrived yesterday. That's where I'm living now. I lived in, uh, here in New York for 26 years. Um, I would like to honor, first of all, the people of Manhattan, the Lenape, um, because we are here on their soul, on their soil. <laughs> To all present and past ancestors, as I get ready to present what I have brought from, for you today, I honor their presence in this precious island named Manahata. We should not forget that this is a Lenapa island named Manahata. I also would like to honor uh, my professors from whom, whom I've learned so much. Um, uh, my grandmothers who were basically speakers of the language. My dear mentor, Dr. Joshua Fishman, who left us in 2015. I work with him since 1999 until his untimely death. However, he left us a wealth of knowledge for us to depart, to depart on linguistic justice. I also should mention Dr. Ngugi Wationgo, who was also my professor at NYU and Dr. Tobas Kudnap Kangas, who is always an incredible source of inspiration for me, and Dr. Ramon Grossfogel, whose ideas on decoloniality helped me walk and up, act upon the diverse effects of language discrimination and the system, social or educational, who use language to create or invent the inferior, the illiterate, illiterate um, and who have placed us in what Fanon said, the zone of not being, or the zone of inhumanity. We, the many communities of minority or indigenous languages of the world. Communities representing massive amounts of people whose right to exercise the use of their mother tongues have been denied. Many of us, as well as many of these languages, have survived the effects of colonialism and now, in a post-colonial time, still remain as languages and peoples that are viewed as a problem. Uh, only partial or almost no linguistic justice has been executed as our languages are still the first one to be disappearing at, as, at present. As Mary Lou Pratt pointed out years ago in her work, Arts of the Contact Zones, 
The people speaking these languages have been denied equality, and we still survive in asymmetrical instances, resisting and becoming experts into what Pratt called the arts of the contact zone. I was born in such situation, daughter of both migrant parents in urban Lima, uh, urban center li like Lima, Peru, in the 1960s. I would like to say that the least that I could say is that Lima was like a linguistic apartheid to my mother and to the many speakers of more than 90 local languages in Peru. Since I've developed my life and accompanying my family members, as well as got used to the rules of a monolingual Spanish-only Lima. Describing a bilingual household is not precisely what I remember in my home. Um, remember, in my home, my mom represented the Quechua language, but she herself had been already ousted from speaking Quechua every day because her family moved from a more rural environment to a semi-rural area, area in which Castellano Andino, or Andean Castellano, which is what Margarita referred to, which is a variety of Spanish that is spoken mainly by people who have uh, Quechua as a first language, no? Was spoken more than anything else. My grandmothers were basically more Quechua speakers, but to my mom, the language began to fade as the linguistic repertoire of my family began to fade into Spanish, first Spanish, Andean Spanish, and then later, when they moved into Lima, this Andean Spanish, which was highly discriminated, was really not appropriate. So they began to sort of evolve into a different kind of accent, which was the coastal, coastal uh, Spanish. No? Without me choosing, I, be, I became part of what Dr. Fishman first proposed as the intergenerational, intergenerational A-level graded uh, disruption scale. My family kept undergoing these transformations of separating their offspring in the family from the language of our ancestors. I was basically denied the possibility to inherit my grandma and my great grandma's language, language by these rules and regulations that have very rarely been written or specified. And that is my mother, in that have become the matter of my constant professional and personal concentration, which is called language policy. Let me, these are some of the things I'm, I'm going to concentrate on. Let me just go ahead. Okay. I'm talking here about the invisibility of the languages. Okay. Um, I'm going to start by citing Dr. Gugi Wationgo's um, citation that says, language is the carrier of culture and memory. To starve or kill a language is to starve and kill a people's memory bank. And written and forced on, force on us as the establishment of civilization brought to us, by indigenous, to, to us in indigenous America by the settlers or the conquerors in the 17th or 18th century, they all left the print. Colonial language policies forced uh, that the only valid languages, the, the ones who could make you human were the ones they brought with them. Policies of erasing our languages has, have been in effect for centuries, and yet my heart smiles when I hear the new regener generation of rap artists that are now um, surfacing the language. These are some of the things that I am doing on Facebook. This is the group of rap, uh, rap artists that I wanted to talk to you about. Although um, I am mentioning now a lot of these policies, colonial policies of uh, erasing our languages, what you have there is a, a, a group of young rap artists um, that are um, doing art and doing like a continuation. No? This, this break of, of using the language uh, is being sort of mended by them. And you see, all of them are less than 30 years, 30 years old. Let me tell you the names of many of them because they are participating in a project that I am developing in, in Latin America right now. One of them, and you can find him there, his name is Una Isu. He is a trilingual rap that does rap in three languages, Spanish, English, and Mixteco. His real name is Mi Mi Miguel Villegas, and he uh, was born in Oaxaca and crossed the border with his mom as an illegal. Um, and 
he remained speaking um, Mixteco, and he began to learn English, and also, of course, he spoke some Spanish. No? He actually didn't speak a lot of Spanish, he was telling me. You can find his work on YouTube and also on Google. Um, the second person I would like to mention is Luanco Minuto Soler. You see him there. He um, revived, he, he had lost his language, the Mapudungun from the Mapuche, Mapuche people in Chile. And he, um, he is an educator. He relearned the language, and now he is one of the main people in the revitalization process of um, the Mapudungun in, in, um, in Chile. Then next, I would like to point out on Liberato Cani. Um, Liberato Cani is, I've written a couple of articles already in English about him. Um, Liberato is a young, he's, he was 19 when, when he began to do rap in Quechua. The, the Quechua is a family of languages. So he does, Quech, he does rap in Quechua Chanca, Quechua Southern, Southern Chanca, which is understood in Cusco and in other areas. No? His effect on um, mainstream Peruvian monolingual Spanish uh, people is huge. And um, now he's already 21 and he's producing a lot. And the last one I would like to mention is Ever Miranda. I don't know if you can see him there. Ever is, was one of the, co the founders of a rap group called um, um, Wine Rap that they rap in Aymara. Okay, also they're, they're, um, they're being mentioned in many places. And I would like to say that when I really um, think about, um, when I look at them and I am in contact with them in my group that I have on language rights on Facebook, I know something went terribly wrong with colonization. Something did not work out as was expected and I smile from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> I wish when people like me People that come from these experiences of being denied a voice, being denied expression. When we look, as I do, at issues of present language discrimination, and we try to act upon via macro and micro language policy recommendations, or when we defend the languages and the communities of speakers of these same languages, um, we are addressing them from a very different uh, perspective. One is, it's not something from the outside, but it's a very personal story and not only we are interested in the situation of our mother tongues but also of our territories okay our rivers our mountains and our mother waterfalls of nature surrounding us settler colonialism to me is still here and that is why that is why the defense of our uh, voices or mother tongues is not only a matter of academic intervention or public policies recommendation into what in Peru right now and many other countries in Latin America has arrived as the policies of inclusion. It is a very deeply, a very deep family responsibility to speak up and act upon the destruction of our communities being denying us to be autonomous or to speak our languages, revive them, revitalize them under our own terms. The policies of, of inclusion, I feel, do not address this. Go, going back to the theory, we address, if, when we address global justice for indigenous languages, we should, we should remember that as the languages are important, we claim respect for them. The speakers of these languages deserve, deserve the same exact respect as the languages. There could be no division. And I point out, as in my own experience and what I have heard from speakers of native languages in, from diverse parts of the world, um, many professionals, in special the ones who get near the communities to learn the language, have, have had a keen interest in the languages per se, and many times despise or not pay honor to the speakers of those languages themselves. Needless to say that um, I should point out that no, no one can be an expert in anyone's language more than the community of speakers themselves and the el elders in those communities. Let me go. This is some of the other um, creations that some of the young people. This is Machigenga from Cusco, from the areas of Cusco. This is happening in a form of what we call um, linguistic landscape, and I have been very involved in this, um, uh, including um, working with um, uh, some some uh, state projects about uh, looking at this. 
these are some of the things that I put in my, in my, um, in my group on Facebook, and I'm going to talk to you about them because I know I have no, not a lot of time. This is one that became very popular in the group, which shows, I think, again, what I am telling to you about, which is um, the indigenous languages problem, let's say, it's a structural discrimination, okay? And what we, all we request is that we, we have, you should have respect for the languages as well as respect for the speakers. Here are some of the things that I include in terms of more, let's say, directed to academic and numbers. Um, this is another project that I am developing that is looking at the world through the uh, words of their poets. Poetry is, is a big uh, item right now. Of, as many uh, people in Latin America are writing in uh, indigenous language, in a bilingual format, no? These are also some of the other um, uh, posters that I include in my list and I will be talking this is another one also and I'm going to start I think I'm going to jump a little bit because I can't look at everything um, okay when I talk about starting a language right advocacy uh, project I think I never expected in 2015 and 16 when I began this group on Facebook um, that it will grow to almost 7,000 right now, very active members. And we have been able to gather people who are constantly in interacting. We have more than 50 administrators in the group. And um, these are two people that are very active uh, members of the group. One of them is Irma, jo uh, Irma Pineda who is a Zapotec uh, poet and writer, extraordinary, that is her book. And the other one is Patsy Batsarrica, who, is the, uh -huh, who, is the, um, uh, who was the person in charge of uh, um, language policy in the Basque region. Uh -huh. And that uh, Tania also, we've shared um, panels. These are some of the... These are three people that I have quoted in some of my interventions. One is Miguel Leon Portilla, who talks about people, people that can love in all languages should be respected, Patsy Batsarrica, and John Mohawk. Okay, I am doing a lot of quotes from John Mohawk, translating them into Spanish. We are using both languages, Spanish and English, as a contact point. Uh, this is Ngugi Wationgo translated in written format to Quechua. It's become quite popular. It's sort of jumped into being um, almost a viral effect. Okay. Uh, next is this is uh, Marisol Mena, who is the um, Anchor TV uh, Quechua speaking Anchor TV at uh, Peru in uh, national TV. And this is another one. So what we do? Gugi Wationgo. These are some questions that I am posing that will probably take more time. This is what I did for um, 2018. Um, I am specifying there how important it is that the new languages receive the, the language, per se. Um, this is the group of poets that I was telling you about. It's important that you know this. In Mexico right now, there is a huge renaissance, more or less like the time in which the Native American language um, poets and writers be started a, group, a, a huge renaissance with Joy Harjo and, you know, a lot of the... I, I was there in 1992 in Oklahoma when we had a meeting. And this is what's happening with them, okay? You, you have there Zapoteco... Um, I would highlight Irma, Irma Pineda. I also would highlight um, Ruby Sanda, who is Purepecha. And I will have uh, Martin Tonal Mayotl, fabulous. So if you're looking, Pluralia Ediciones is looking. They are all participants in daily participants on my list on language rights. And it is from them that I get a lot of the reflections that I have been sharing with you about. Again, this is Irma in Zapotec and Uber Matiwa. And let me just go straight to, there, I have a lot of visual to share. And I know, okay. Making languages visible. 
This is what we're doing. We are expanding the consciousness on language rights. This is where I'm, I'm, as soon as I end this, I'm going to finish. One of the, the people participating in my projects are people from the Voces del Gran Nayar, Universidad de, uh, de Nayarit. And they are doing an extraordinary group of uh, videos about language rights and about their own language, Wisharika. Okay, that's one of the elders. You can see Pampariyatsu, how do you say hello in, um, in Wisharika? Here you have another extraordinary language defender. He is absolutely fabulous. His name is Victoriano Teposteco. He has just started, um, well, he does classes broadly in Nahuatl. His Nahuatl, I've heard, is one of the best ones. It's a really very well-developed language, and he cares to constantly be expanding it. He has an electronic, academic, and literary um, digital um, new, um, magazine called Yolitia. Okay? And here you have someone that is, very, is one of my, my more, most important administrators in the list. His name is Massimiliano uh, Verde. He is the president of the Academia Napolitana. And you can see him in action there. This, these are his interventions on the importance of Napolitano. And before I go from, from Massimiliano, I would like to say that he's befriended a lot of Quechua in the, in the group. And they, is, they are starting a glossary, which will be a dictionary that goes from Ma Napolitano into English directly. Another person that I would say, this is not necessarily under the category of indigenous, but he's a Scottish, um, very active in my, in my list. His name is Finley McLeod. As you can see, he has, um, he has a more directed to learn the language per se, and very interested in um, developing uh, projects for children of less than three years and the parents. Dr. Fishman had contact with him, so we have been sort of friends, and he's very active in my list. He, uh, he works from Scotland, and he has the Morai Language Center. Okay. And this is another very active person. His na her name is, um, she has a, a project in Cusco that you should read about. Um, Juliana uh, Gamarra is doing right now a lot of work with, in the UNSAC on, with um, uh, college students. There. This is a group of these are a group of poets that are also participating. They are Quechua speaking poets living in Lima. And I guess I will end with these are some more projects that I am including. Um, I will end here because I know I had a lot more things to say. But um, as you understand, my point in general here, to be sincere, is that we would understand that the language is, a, is sort of a space to recuperate um, our uh, identity. And that we should not let go of these projects as thinking of them as autonomous and reflecting our sovereign, sovereign state. Okay? Thank you. We now move to our last speaker, Dr. William Noteworthy, who is going to talk about language survival in Southeast Asia. So this is a proper transition to Southeast Asia. Yeah. <clears throat> How's the volume? Is good? OK. Uh, thank you very much to Professor Liu. And uh, of course, I'm very excited to be a guest on the island of Manhattan. Uh, I'm traveling from Wisconsin. I'm sort of permanently a guest. Uh, I've been a guest in Cambodia. I've been a guest in Vietnam. Uh, I grew up as a guest in Abenaki uh, lands. So uh, yeah, it's uh, very uh, inspiring to be here. And it's great to learn from so many uh, field experts and people doing so much great work. Um, so I'm speaking uh, a bit from the perspective of a historian of religion, which is a little bit different take than, I, than some other folks might have. Um, but m my work is very much uh, focused on community engagement. And uh, I have some bones to pick with other uh, more senior historians who I won't mention by name. Um, so, uh, 
this here is uh, a well-circulated uh, map of ethnic groups in Vietnam, including in indigenous populations. And you have uh, sedang speaking populations, Banar, Jarai, which is an Austronesian language, Rade, uh, and then down here you have Raglai and Cham. And it, this may shock you, but this map was uh, widely circulated by the Central Intelligence Agency, and uh, it's not the most accurate. Um, I know, it's shocking, right? <laughs> the CIA in the 1970s did not have the most accurate information about Southeast Asia, it turns out. <laughs> um, so, so why is this why is this map important? Um, well, this map is important not because uh, I received it or I brought it to my to my field work, but it was actually given to me in the field, specifically because uh, communities that I work with were living on the north side of a city right here, and they speak Cham, and they said that uh, we'd been erased from the map, right? Uh, so this was colleagues of mine, um, and the uh, they're sort of speaking in this context of indigenous populations in, in Southeast Asia. And uh, this was in 2011, so the discourse of indigenous rights had been increasing at the time uh, after newly circulated protocols by the United Nations. Um, so there's also uh, an internal discourse of indigeneity in Southeast Asia, which is quite complex, right? Uh, so you have, for example, in Malaysia, the concepts of uh, Bumi Putera, uh, referring to Malay populations, or Orang Asli, referring to non-Malay indigenous populations, right? Um, uh, in Cambodia, you have Chun Chit versus uh, Khmer Lu. Uh, so this could be uh, indigenous Cambodians who are Khmer or uh, minorities, right? Uh, who are not Khmer but are still indigenous. Um, so in the case of Cambodia, it something that I learned was that Cham are not usually considered indigenous, but in diaspora, even though they've lived there for hundreds of years. Uh, but they are an ethnic minority. Uh, whereas in Vietnam, uh, Cham are both considered uh, Yan Top Thieu So, which is an ethnic minority, uh, as well as Yan Top Bang Dia, which is indigenous. Um, so this was uh, a bit of a learning moment for me because and growing up in the United States, it was sort of, there are people who are not indigenous and there are people who are indigenous, right? Uh, but in Southeast Asia, there are these layers of indigeneity to uh, learn about and negotiate with. So this is part of the open question uh, behind the work. This is uh, just a quick map that we created <laughs> as a teaching mnemonic in, in response to uh, the CIA map. So the idea for this was actually my colleague uh, Sakara came up with this idea. He said we could just use Google Maps and drop GIS pins in the proper places for the towns. So I dropped a few pins for towns that we visited and then uh, we blew up the province that he wanted to look at and this was the city and here was the area of speakers on the other map and then we started dropping pins around important sites to show where the historic villages had been for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, we also color-coded them so that you could see uh, the pins in blue, which are uh, minority Muslim villages, and the pins in green, which are minority Hindu villages, uh, because this was an important religious concept for that community. is built off of the uh, collaboration between Hindus and Muslims, uh, envisioned through cosmic dualism. So there's the sun and the moon, and there's Hinduism and Islam, and there's male and female, and all of these elements work together. Uh, the list goes on, by the way. There's hundreds of permutations to that. Um, so one of the questions that I was working with as a historian was how do we take these language resources and, and treat them with the respect that they deserve and uh, write about the history of that particular area. So um, this is new maps that started appearing on Wikipedia magically. <laughs> um, 
from from colleagues of mine who are, who are working on on this material, and so they started putting on the indigenous territories uh, as they had existed in the 17th century, and also the the kingdoms, and uh, rethinking about the way that the history had been written by scholars in colonial languages, specifically French. Uh, they describe Vietnamese as a colonial language, which was interesting to me, um, and English as a colonial language, right? Um, so, uh, one of the one of the conversations was this: What does a civilization mean? What does a kingdom mean? How do we describe these terms? So they refer to this entire area as the civilization of Champa. There were many indigenous peoples who were part of that civilization. There was, uh, at one point, a unified kingdom of Champa, but there are also independent city-state kingdoms uh, that are part of this sort of federation. Um, so uh, this, uh, over time, there's this historical narrative that there's pressure from the Vietnamese that, that conquers these kingdoms from the 15th through the 19th century. Uh, but was actually, uh, pretty important is when we look at the sources that were being written in Cham script is from the 17th to the 19th century, the Vietnamese empire is the Nguyen empire. So it's actually a different type of state than in previous centuries. It's based in a different area. Uh, it starts to adapt and assimilate uh, Cham practices and Cham religions into Vietnamese contexts. Um, so it, there's really this uh, mixing of cultures that happens from the 17th to the 19th century that contributes to a really interesting phenomenon where Vietnamese words are adapted as Cham words. We normally describe them as loan words, but sometimes they take on different meanings, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so those words are Cham words, even though as an outsider, I might see them as Vietnamese. Right? Uh, and so that was an important sort of learning process to keep in mind uh, while working on this history project. Um, additionally, what, what I was interested in was how uh, the history and the, the language itself had been revived in Vietnamese contexts, uh, not with international partners. So this is going on in the 1980s, uh, after 1975 internal to Cham communities, and it's all Cham experts, right? Um, so they are working with nominal permission from the Vietnamese government. Uh, no external funding, though, <laughs> right? Um, so this is uh, uh, the Cham Text Board Compilation Society. Uh, essentially, what they're doing um, is they're organizing and they're, they're writing and they're publishing something that's very similar to uh, somebody I'd like to think of as sort of a mentor and, and a colleague, uh, Professor Cortina, is working on a similar project with uh, other colleagues of mine in Cambodia. So there's uh, orthography guides where they're using these orthography guides to, to teach uh, the teachers in the community. Um, they do similar, actually very similar things to this, which is a collection uh, of folk stories or children's stories. Uh, where they've been pulled together from the community and then recirculated. Uh, I'm showing you the versions from Cambodia, but this is what's going on in Vietnam, too, in an earlier period. Um, they also have uh, this approach of writing newsletters, right? So this is a contemporary one from, uh, it's Mukva in Cambodia. And the subject material is, here you have a picture of the Pon Ino Nagan Tower, which is a religious site in Vietnam. But the subject material is, is writing about that, and it's uh, for the Cham community in Cambodia. Um, then uh, you also have uh, debates that emerge in these contexts, of course. How is the script going to be adapted? What way are we going to teach the language? Uh, there's a sort of interesting phenomenon of, uh, in the 1960s, there had been American missionaries in the area. Uh, associated with the Summer Institute of Linguistics, who had miserably failed to push romanization. <laughs> um, and, but what came out of that was that there was a, 
a pedagogical adaptation for a push for a simplified script uh, at a point in the 1980s so that it be, could be taught in, in a standardized fashion uh, to primary school students. And then the more scholarly levels of the script could be taught to upper level students. So uh, you have this sort of staging of the language pedagogy. Uh, throughout these critiques and conversations, uh, new materials and conferences are held into the 2000s, and, and it's in the, really in the 2000s that you start to see training programs in Vietnamese uh, universities emerge around this uh, script revitalization effort. <clears throat> so part of my line of questioning here is uh, where are religious rights and revival related in this specific history and in this community? Um, so this would be a rather typical Chambani script uh, where you have Chambani language here reading left to right as an index script, and then you have an adaptation of Arabic script for a Quranic verse reading right to left. And the individual who would use these manuscripts is a religious leader who would know both languages in addition, by the way, to being fluent in Vietnamese, right? In addition to perhaps also knowing French for scholarly purposes or Malay for scholarly purposes or in more contemporary settings, English. Um, so one of the pressures that my colleague uh, Sakara expressed to me was that throughout the levels of language learning, Chan, Cham always have to be polyglots, right? They always have to be at least trilingual. Um, so it, it's an extreme amount of pressure to be a scholar in this community. Uh, but the scripts are important for religious legions because essentially what you have is the directions for the prayers in Cham, and then the prayers are in Arabic. Uh, so for example, in the first one, Yang nan kuku blo du ni, which is, um, Basically, for this blessing, uh, you read this prayer, right? It's a very simple line, <laughs> but it, it's directional, uh, and it's important for that reason. So these uh, manuscripts and this sort of use of the language is most directly related to living heritage sites, which is important in the context of this community because uh, as far as the international community is concerned, UNESCO has recognize the Champa civilization sites as being heritage sites that stretch up the coast of Vietnam and they're sort of viewed as ancient uh, and there's a subtle implication that they are not living, although it's not stated, right? <laughs> um, but the, the push from activists in the community and younger scholars in the community has been for greater recognition for these living heritage sites. So. Um, we we're very excited to have a colleague, Isvan Champa, who is working on this issue for his PhD in an Australian university right now. Um, and so what he's been working on is greater recognition of mid-range heritage sites. Uh, so these are local shrines, temples, uh, what's called uh, Sang Magik, or uh, an adaptation of a local version of a mosque for the syncretic Bani community. Um, and so these are the sites where you are most likely to find a high degree of language fluency, right? So this is important to sort of uh, get greater recognition for these sites for this revitalization effort. Um, there are also ancestral grave sites called either Kut for the Hindu community or Gun for the Bani community. <clears throat> and uh, Basically, the idea uh, from Isfan's perspective was to encourage greater recognition of this sort of interactive relationship between religion, uh, heritage, history, and everyday life uh, as well. Um, so part of this effort was also from Cham scholars to get uh, recognition for the need for revival, a Cham language revival, but in Vietnam, um, so, it, we were mentioning judicial issues earlier. 
it's tricky because the Vietnamese legal context is not the same as the international legal context and not even close to the American legal context, right? Um, so scholars are sort of negotiating this, this process of how, how do you make the argument for the need for revival in a Vietnamese legal context. Mm -hmm. So Sakaya uh, took a survey of 100 males, found out that 78% spoke Cham, but only 7% were completely literate, right? So uh, the danger for spoken Cham decreasing does not seem to be very high, but the literacy decreasing seems to be sort of threatened or is perceived as threatened. Um, so again, my colleague Sakara and actually his uncle uh, and one of my language teachers, Jatu Di Hamu Limon, uh, published an argument in Vietnamese in 2011 where they called the script uh, part of the critical contribution to the understanding of Vietnam as a multicultural society. <laughs> and that was a brilliant argument uh, because it got all kinds of p permissions for revitalization efforts and for language teaching. Uh, whatever the combination of Vietnamese words was right there, it worked. Um, so after that, there was a brief UNESCO-affiliated uh, language center that ran for a few years that was sort of uh, the garage band of language teaching. Um, yeah. Uh, so we had uh, volunteer teachers who taught CHOM. Uh, we had people who came in and taught in other subjects, uh, taught about CHOM history in Vietnamese. Um, I volunteered as an English teacher, but I was mostly a student and a researcher. And uh, we, we built a local archive. Uh, we worked with groups in Cambodia, uh, colleagues uh, of Professor Cortinas in Cambodia, especially Abu Paka, exchanging materials across the Cambodian and Vietnamese sort of uh, branches, the eastern and western branches of the Cham community, uh, and sort of started building a, a language uh, resource center, a digital, uh, I hesitate to use the word archive because I don't want to say that it's stashed away somewhere, right? But it is, <laughs> I'm a historian, sorry. Um, but, you know, it's a, an, a resource center, a digital resource center that could be accessed. So then the next problem is, um, well, how do you have it accessed online? So I'm going to think about these more contemporary efforts, right? How do you increase access? Uh, one of these efforts has been building off of the Unicode of CHOM script, which uh, happened in the 1990s through the 2000s. And this was the Eastern CHOM script. Um, so you start to see more and more Vietnamese publishing houses open to publishing CHOM script. Uh, slowly over time, over the course of a decade. The Toyota Foundation uh, boosted projects in the 1990s by uh, providing funds for research of the language, deep uh, historical research, research for religious contexts, uh, research for contemporary usage. Um, Ho Chi Minh emerged as a center of institutional support, although there was a bit of debate uh, between individuals who are more focused on revitalization efforts for primary school purposes and individuals who are interested in really high-level scholarly usage of the language. Um, so there was an existing debate between those groups. Um, but what's come out of that has been a greater push for online dictionaries. Um, so there's uh, kautara.com is a, an emerging online dictionary that's being built. Um, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about Tagalog. Tagalog is, I, it, it is a website. It can be found online. Um, but it is essentially a, a partner publication uh, in terms of concept to Mukva in that it has uh, Cham script and it also has Vietnamese, although uh, what's important about the Cham script in Tagalog is it's not translated. Um, so it has, uh, if there's a poem written in Cham script, it's just in Cham. Um, if it's written in, sometimes it's in Romanized because the author chooses to do that. 
Um, some youth have decided to do that, some youth authors have. Um, and so they've uh, really been pushing these uh, L1 fluency uh, of usage of the language in this production. We also have uh, another sort of uh, digital platform that I've been working on. So this is a map of the Cham Ayen community, uh, but this is from the Database of Religious History, which is a new platform based out of the University of British Columbia. And the idea is that scholars and experts and uh, individuals who are closely tied to communities, community activists, who I would call community experts, um, could enter uh, religious information in the database, but also connect that to the language usage, right? Um, so that's one particular topic. Uh, the last one is, uh, these are a bit blurry, but this is chamstudies.net. And so this is uh, primarily a project of Isfan Champa and several other younger scholars. And what we do is we take new research um, and also videography and films and language lessons and make those accessible in Vietnamese and English and then also videos of the uh, primary use of the language too, so Cham as well. Um, so this is actually an open website. It's extremely low budget, of course. Uh, it's all volunteer. It's mostly done by graduate students, quite frankly. Um, but. Uh, Hopefully, you know, people who are here could go and visit the site and comment on it and we could exchange ideas and that might be a way to sort of continue this conversation. Um, so I'll close it there. Thank you. the Rohingya and the, the Yazidi. And I think because that was part of your introduction, I also couldn't help interpreting your project through the frame of humanitarian aid. Uh, so I was wondering if you felt that there might be uh, any risk of this project engaging in, in the way that humanitarian aid is, which is a new form of colonization in some aspects. One is epistemic. Um, because I, I think Dimitri's question from the earlier panel is really important um, as to how we need to reassess as historians, as academics, he was speaking about academics in general, as to archival knowledge and methodology. Um, so the, just in terms of this, the standardizing script, it, it might also uh, leave unexamined or uh, allow us to escape further reflection on how, what it means to know. So that's the epistemic colonization. The institutional colonization is um, just always follow the money, right? Like I thought it was very interesting that you mentioned the Luce Foundation, which is part of the Department of Defense. Um, William, you mentioned the Toyota Foundation, and so uh, not the Department of Defense. However, I thought it was a really good segue into thinking how under the UNESCO framework, we are accepting this conversation of rights in the framework of the paradigm of nation states, which is an, the reorganization historically of nation state order for liberal global capitalism. So the Toyota Foundation is not excluded from that. Also, I think um, in terms of uh, ontologies that are what we're trying to preserve with language, uh, one of the, the important things that it asks of us is to reassess what we think of as metaphors. So I realize this sounds like a semantic game, but I don't think it's, it's trivial that you use words like, you know, you're showing the map, which is a very ambivalent uh, kind of artifact, uh, right? I mean, it's conquering, it's also knowing where you're placed, but it's a tool, it's a, it can be militarized. But you've said things like, oh, we blew up the province. Uh, oh, we dropped pins here. Like, I, I just want to encourage us, you know, since we're thinking about language, to also take words very, very seriously. Um, I also just want to close this by saying I'm definitely not accusing either you or Professor Anderson for being nefarious and, and villainous, um, but I also think it's an important, I, I kind of want to share an allegory really quickly since we've done a really good, you know, important work, uh, which I feel like we should all just take with us everywhere in acknowledging that we're on occupied land and acknowledging this is territory from uh, the, the Lenape Indians, this is Manhattan. So I want to tell one more story about uh, Manhattan, which is just imagine that you are a scientist and every single day for a decade you go into a lab thinking you're just doing the most, like the least instrumentalizable possible project, right? You're just doing pure theory. 
And then you wake up one day and you realize you've been working on the Manhattan Project. So that's, that's what I'm provoking, that's all. Thank you to the other questioner for um, mentioning that this is occupied Lenape land, and I'd just like to follow up on that. Um, so as has been referred to throughout these panels, um, we are on occupied Lenape land. And I don't think, I think we should keep in mind that this isn't um, one event that happened in the distant past. Um, Columbia is still the largest private landholder in Manhattan, and Columbia has um, an immense amount of properties around the island that is still generating wealth for the university. And none of this wealth gets into the hands of the indigenous um, inhabitants of Manhattan, um, whose dispossession uh, contributes to Columbia existing and having these massive amounts of wealth. So my question is, how can we envision an ownership of the university that takes into account this history of dispossession and um, can be you know, how can we envision um, indigenous ownership of the university that is going to um, have a component of uh, material um, um, restorative justice? Uh, and I realize that many panelists aren't actually from Columbia University, but you're also, you're from other universities that probably um, have similar um, histories of complicity and colonization, so yeah. Well, who would we direct a proposal to to identify whose opinion all of these data are? like a, a way of denoting whether it comes from the state or the academic or the indigenous and which act indigenous, a, a system for showing that. Um, I'll make it brief. I think that the question on uh, language is not complete without bringing in the power differential. Mm -hmm. So um, the some of you touched on it, but I am interested in hearing a specific, how do you elevate the social status of indigenous language in every context that you have worked on? And I think that this uh, play an important role in the motivation of the parents, as well as motivation of the children. Thank you. I can briefly answer the question about Rohingya. Uh, that particular case, uh, I, when I run my when I run my project, uh, I try to make sure that we for, hear first from the user community. And that one came from the user community. It wasn't a um, scholar who said, "Oh, let's do Rohingya." And um, so that particular came came directly from them. And unfortunately, even if it gets in Unicode, from what I understand. Uh, it, it, it means a lot to the community, but right now, uh, because of the situation with the Rohingya, uh, a lot of them are, they have many other issues uh, that they're facing, and actually uh, language instructions being done more in Bengali and uh, maybe Myanmar, uh, Burmese. Um, so right now it's probably not going to be actively used, but... Okay, I'll go very quickly. Um, so one thing that we do on this website to sort of identify uh, thinking about where information is coming from and also power differentials is we give, uh, we give profiles of scholars and it's not highlighted on there, but it, it's very clear. Um, so. Some of the scholars are 
coming from French institutions. Some of the scholars are coming from the Cham community. Some of them are English language scholars. So they're sort of uh, sorted by uh, individuals who are working with specific languages. But that push was from Isfan, who is the senior editor. So that was his idea. Um, and so a lot of this material is just material that I just said, OK, Isfan, it's your idea. We're going to do it. Um, and I think that if you go, you brought up global capitalism. Interesting. I mean, I moved to Vietnam because I wanted to live in a socialist country, but I can't tell my students that, right? Um, so if we go very much back to my hyper-problematic language of dropping pins and blowing up the province, in addition to the irony of that, uh, right, is that two of the pins are the planned sites of uh, the first commercial nuclear reactors in Vietnam. Um, no longer planned, by the way, but they were planned at the time. And the reason that they are no longer planned is uh, safety concerns. And there was some successful petitioning, which is a different topic for a different day, but also related to indigenous rights, no doubt. Um, there was some successful petitioning for raising concerns about the safety of those development sites. So that's an ongoing issue that we could talk about um, that's on that hyper-problematic map. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, first, I would like to build on something that came out with both um, my colleagues here, is the, um, the part of multi-scriptivism which is very important, okay? Because not only languages are in danger, but many of these um, scripts are in danger too. And um, just to mention, that's also brought up, being brought up in my group, which has now almost 7,000 members. And uh, we are beginning now to um, jump from the Roman script, kind of uh, publishing all these posters that you've seen, to include some of the different kind of ideas they sent to me in uh, Unicode, many of them. And um, I have just been posting them without translation so far. And I am expecting for some of the people in different communities around the world who are in the group to pick up and maybe go from Chom to Quechua directly without jumping Spanish or English. So that's one part that I find really important and I, um, I would say um, there is a richer, um, a rich, a very important part of the world that express their language, and the language is tied to a, to a script, to a particular script. Okay, in indigenous Latin America, I think we have been, um, we are still looking for many things that are sort of hidden. Okay, which is a different story. The second part that I would like to say is that. Uh, the group that I, f I founded in 2016 has grown up so much because I think there is a need from people to express themselves about issues related to their language. So talking about Bernard Spolsky and what he proposed of um, efforts to do language rights or uh, to create language policies that will be from coming from um, up to down I think that my project is basically picking picking up people from that communities that will go from down up. Okay, that's very important to me. And at this point, I think that the digital signs that I've seen, the digital posters that you're, that you're seeing, basically written in Spanish or English, and then using the Roman script to, speak, to write in Quechua or many of the different languages of Mexico or Central America, I think that could be upgraded more if we use podcasts, okay? So that's my next move. I would like to start um, a website in which I would assign a specific, uh, I mean, whoever, I, of course, I have to look at the groups, but I will assign uh, specific spaces in, on this website for people to send me uh, messages in, and via post podcast to be able to have the sound. Okay, uh, and the third part of this is about the Lenape um, Manahata that I, you have to understand, I live in Peru for the last two, three years. <laughs> so 
I just would like to say that I've met a number of Lenape people, and I was, I was very moved when I felt I and I actually discovered this in 2015 um, when I met Stephen Newcomb, who is a Lenape scholar. I was so moved when I said to myself, I have been living in Manhattan for so long, and it never occurred to me to think about this on a daily daily life on a, on a daily um, you know basis. And since it's very clear to me that that is an important aspect of understanding this island. NYU, Hunter College, City College, all of them are on the soil uh, of what was once the, terri the original territory of the Lenape. And I, I always, every time that I start um, a presentation, I pay respect for that. Okay, and thank you very much. Okay, I'm really got, trying to do um, uh, the impossible and keep this very short. In New Zealand, Aotearoa, we have what is called the Waitangi Tribunal. It emerged out of history of, of, of revolution and protest. And, um, and that's an important aspect of our history because the Waitangi Tribunal is a forum for where we can air our grievances as Māori um, tribes. It's a very, um, it's a mixed process where we have a tribunal that we present those grievances to. I've been privy to be able to, uh, to present to the tribunal for the Kohanga Reo and injustices by the Ministry of Education on, um, and we're just coming through that now in terms of looking at an indigenous framework to be able to then settle our grievances with the Crown. Having said that then, um, out of this has come the opportunity for tribal commun uh, indigenous communities to then look at co-management models, which is getting back to what we call the Treaty of Waitangi in, the 18, in 1840, which was signed as a, as a perceived um, uh, covenant partnership between Māori and, uh, and non-Māori. So the co-management model, um, for example, the co-management of the Waikato River, to return this eponymous ancestor of ours to its original glory, because it's very polluted. So that's, it's a, it's a co-management model between the Crown taking, uh, taking um, responsibility with the iwi. So there are those models in place. I also want to just touch very um, uh, on, I can't, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, uh, but we looked at, uh, you're looking at issues around uh, power differential and the element and, and how, in terms of the elevating the status of language, all of those sorts of things, ownership by institutions um, that have uh, property in terms of, of and, and we'll leave it at that. The issue that I have is that through the, this process of the Waitangi Tribunal, Māori now become landlords. They're landlords, like, for example, at Waikato University, they're landlords of the university. So what we have is a forum, a, uh, a group called uh, Manukura, and every one of the tribal communities that not necessarily, doesn't necessarily have land rights, but have rights in terms of the, uh, the demography of students that come from maybe the East Coast, all different parts of New Zealand, they have a representative, a tribal representative on that manukura. And those recommendations that are coming from that group are considered in terms of the mana of the university, uh, the university council, which is a, probably a different uh, construct or um, organisational um, management model than what, we, what is, happens here in the US. Nevertheless, the system is, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that Anything is possible when you get the right kind of processes in place, um, and we have done that through a grievance process, a history of huge protest in our country, to fight for the right of Indigenous peoples on land, on the air we breathe in terms of broadcasting rights, for children uh, and their education, um, for, uh, uh, and now a new one, a new one that's coming through is data sovereignty. Who owns the data? in the collection of all of this material and, and all this knowledge and DNA and personal profiles. Who owns the data? 
And so for us now, um, that's a very, very big issue that we're all confronting. And when I talk about, when I hear my colleagues talk about digital archiving, I just want to say that our institute, which is part of a university, so it receives public money, external funding for its existence, is got MOUs with iwi because they know that the relationship that, you know, we have the resources. MOU with iwi, but we will never own the data. Whereas if data is given to the Crown, the Crown can do anything with it. Although a form of protest and engagement with the Crown, they're very wary with this new government. This new government is more respectful than the previous one in terms of at least considering what are the issues first off. But we can, in time, we have in time, and we're not necessarily there yet, but we have negotiated a position of strength to be at the table. Having said that, and I just want to say very quickly, very quickly, while I'm doing contracts around Te Reo Te Paharakeke in terms of, you know, ensuring that, that we invest in as much in language and homes and families that are doing the doing to create new language speakers. I'm also doing, just being contracted by the Māori Language Commission to do a research project called Subject Motivation. And that's to look at schools, businesses, corporates, and what we call local government. And there, the, and canvas them on why they have a Māori language policy, and yet they're not Indigenous as an organisation. And so that's really important to understand what it is that we have in trying to normalise the language in Aotearoa, New Zealand, amongst the non-Indigenous community, as well as investing in supporting um, the growth and survival, pre preservation, resuscitation, regeneration, all of those relations to ensure that the language survives. When we have a Māori language bill now that puts the onus on us, not the Crown. The latest Māori language bill gives Māori, puts Māori the funding back into iwi. Not sure that we're there really to manage that and, have, and, and, and manage that effectively. But it is an important part. Non-Māori are getting into bed with iwi. We're the, one of the biggest economic players. It's good to have the language. Whatever the motivation, we don't care. We want the language to... We want less racism here and more support for us to be able to grow our own language as an Indigenous human right. Kia ora.